Welcome to Cross Lanes United Methodist Church. You're here for virtual worship on April 26, 2020. I'm Pastor Krista Rexrode wolf and I want to welcome you. If you would like to take notes or have a copy of our order of worship, please visit crosslanesumc.org and visit the Faith at Home tab. This morning, we will enter our posture of worship by hearing a musical offering from our accompanist, Deanna Taylor, playing the Lord's Prayer. Good morning. This morning, Alder and I are joining Pe uh, Peggy and Nick from their home, and they're going to share with us the opening prayer. Mysterious God, you walk alongside us even when we do not know it. Help us see you in the days of confusion and despair. Help us see you in the days of healing and joy. Give us wisdom for the journey in every season that we may be messengers of good news. Amen. Amen. I hope the kids in your house are with you for the whole service. I always have them in mind, but I'd like to take this time especially for them. Hi, friends. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the dinner table. In my house, the dinner table is really important. Not only do we play games there and do some of our homework there, but on good weeks, we try four or five times to get all four people who live in our house to sit at the table at the same time to eat dinner. Sometimes we only get to do it once or twice a week, but always when we eat together, we do something really important. We talk to each other. We talk about our days. We talk about school. We talk about work. We talk about all that stuff that happened in the day that made us happy or frustrated. 
the dinner table just seems to be a good place to learn about each other. And it's at the dinner table we normally bring guests. A guest is what we call a person who is visiting our house. Now guests are special to us and we try to show them how special they are by feeding them good food. And you guessed it, talking. As we ask them questions about where they're from and what they do for fun and what kinds of things they do with their families, visitors become friends. In the Bible story today, we are reading in the book of Luke. That's in the New Testament. And it's one of the four books we call a gospel. In the gospel of Luke, he tells a story about some of Jesus's friends. They hadn't seen him in such a long time that his, his friends don't recognize that he is Jesus. They think Jesus is a stranger until he eats dinner with them. When he eats with them and they talk, they are able to tell that the stranger is actually their friend Jesus. And as they eat and talk, they learn new things about each other. That's usually what happens when we eat together. When guests come by talking and eating together, we make friends. And by eating and talking with the people in my family, I get to learn new things about them. This week, I hope you will remember this story about Jesus and the dinner table. Eating dinner with people is one good way to get to know them. And it's fun to learn new things about people, even family and friends. If you would like some help in starting good conversations at your house, have a grown-up help you visit the church website, crosslanesumc.org, and click on the green button labeled Resources for Home Worship. When you click there, you'll find some printable conversation starters for home. Um, you can use them on your tablet or electronic device or, or go ahead and, and print them off. But either way, I hope you'll use them to make new friends and to get to know your, your family better. All right, friends, let's pray together and give God thanks for the dinner table. At Cross Lanes United Methodist Church, when we pray um, during the children's time, we take our hands and we clap them together. And then uh, I will start the prayer and you can repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for the dinner table. And for the people we can invite to it. Amen. Thanks, friends. Have a good Sunday. And now here at this lesson from the gospel. Our gospel lesson for today comes from Luke 24, 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered them, are you the only stra stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? 
Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. As we prepare to hear the sermon this morning, I want to thank Lindsay Hyden for the solo she performed from her home for the glory of God. Thank you, Lindsay, for sharing your gifts with us today. Where are you now when darkness seems to win? Where are you now when the world is crumbling? Oh, I, I, I hear you say, When I began the process of weaning my first child, we were both miserable. She would claw and cry and bury her head in my chest. She would whimper. For a while, she even regressed her eating habits. She was well over a year old and had been eating solid food and growing and gaining weight. But when we started pulling back on the milk, she started refusing solid food in protest. And bedtime was the worst. When we started refusing to nurse her at bedtime, she resisted. After a week of this, we were both tired. I was swollen and my feelings were hurt. And I don't know exactly how she felt um, because she wasn't talking yet, but I know she was restless at night. 
And after a week of this, I nearly gave in and began to nurse her. But I called my mom first. And I said, you weaned four kids. How did you do that? How did you, how did you do this four times? I must not be doing it right. And my mom gave me some sound advice. She said, does it feel like you can't do it? And I said, yes, it does. And she said, well, then you're almost there. Just push yourself a little past what feels like the breaking point and you'll be out of the woods. The hard stuff doesn't last forever. And he was right. Within another 48 hours, the nighttime crying stopped. And that advice has carried us through some other situations with both of my kids. When we started sleep training, when we went through tantrums and the terrible twos, when we transitioned from helping with cleanup to expecting our kids to clean up on their own, going just past the point of comfort, going just a little past when we wanted to give in, helped us see something shift. Now my kids mostly sleep through the night. They mostly clean up after themselves with a little encouragement. During this time of isolation, I've been thinking a lot about that advice. Now I know it's not universally helpful. No one should push themselves too hard or go past their breaking point when it comes to certain things like taking medicine or seeking physical, emotional, or economic assistance. But I do think that advice is helpful right now because it gives me some perspective. When things are hard, my mind has a way of tricking me into thinking the hard stuff is going to last forever. What my mom's advice does is remind me that the hard stuff is finite. In the thick of difficult transitions and complicated decisions, my mom's advice helps me look to the horizon, to the, to the to the point when I can look forward to my optimism taking hold again. I can look forward to better, lighter days coming to fruition. That advice helps me whisper hopeful promises to myself. In the story today, we see two disciples at the moment of a difficult transition. We catch them discussing their disappointment in the Jesus movement and wondering if they can do it if they can live life in a world where Jesus has died. Luke 2, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35, says there were two disciples of Jesus, Cleopas and an unnamed disciple, maybe a woman. They were leaving, like many travelers were, to go home after the Passover festival. But they weren't just going toward home. They were going away from Jerusalem because the things that had happened there were earth-shattering for them. Now, it can be hard for us to remember, um, since we celebrated Resurrection Sunday two weeks ago, but this story actually takes place on the afternoon of Resurrection Sunday, and the followers of Jesus were still shell-shocked. They had been part of a movement. They had followed the one who had raised Lazarus, who had fed the multitudes with nothing but a couple of loaves and fish. They were with the one who was said to have calmed the stormy sea. But now he was nowhere to be found. Jesus had been dead three days. The word used in scripture to describe how they felt is in verse 17. In the common English Bible, the scripture says, the disciples stopped, their faces downcast. In Greek, the word translated here as downcast is much more encompassing. They weren't just downcast. It's not like Olive Garden ran out of breadsticks. These disciples were having all the feelings. They were afraid, sad, angry, dejected. They didn't know exactly what had happened, but they did know that one way of doing life, which they had gotten used to over the course of Jesus's public ministry, well, that life was totally over. The man they followed was dead. The community they loved was divided. And the crowds which had welcomed Jesus into the city a week before were dispersed. I imagine 
the disciples were losing their grip on reality. Had they really seen any of it? Had they really witnessed miracles? How had that man from Nazareth convinced them for so long? As they discuss all of it, a stranger appears to them. Oblivious to what has taken place in the city, he walks with them as they recall their disappointment, their disillusionment with the man that they claimed was recognized by God and the people as a prophet. They tell the stranger on the road to Emmaus about the crucifixion with the excited and mournful cadence of disbelief, saying, we had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. Then they whispered to the stranger, what's more? Some women from our group went to the tomb this morning and didn't find Jesus's body. They told us they had seen a vision of angels who told them Jesus was alive. Some of the group went to check out the tomb and the body was missing all right. We just don't know what to think. At that point, the stranger opened the scripture to them and taught them, saying, um, taught them saying the words of Moses and repeating to them the words of the prophet. The stranger interpreted the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The conversation went on for so long that they made it to their destination, many miles from Jerusalem still engrossed in what he had to say. And so the disciples invited the stranger to stay with them. The stranger accepted their invitation, and as he sat down with them to eat, he broke bread, blessed it, and gave it to them. Something about the whole thing was so familiar, so holy, so freeing to them, that they realize who they are eating with. And suddenly, they recognize the stranger as Jesus and he vanishes. Without missing a beat, the disciples get up and go back to Jerusalem. They trekked back over the road where the stranger had appeared to them. They go back over the road where they had been taught the scriptures. They trek back over the road, which had seemed so long on the way to Emmaus, now shortened on the way back because they are no longer carrying the weight of their grief. They had seen a glimpse of glory and they refused to sit one more moment. Hope was on the rise and they moved toward hope. The story ends with Cleopas and the other disciple finding the 11 apostles. The 11 were still going on about the experience Simon Peter had with Jesus earlier in the day. But unlike Simon, Cleopas and the other disciple hadn't just seen Jesus. Jesus had walked with them in their disappointment. He had walked with them in their confusion. Jesus had encouraged them to push just a little beyond their discontent to catch a snapshot of their future. He told them to hang on. And he used scripture to remind them that the hard stuff doesn't last forever. Hope rises. It can always emerge because God's promises are built on hope and God is faithful to God's promises. God does redeem. God does live. God does not abandon. I love the story of Jesus appearing on the road to Emmaus. He's a sneaky Messiah. The story shows Jesus as a God who doesn't chastise grief or confusion or slowness of heart. In this story, the Messiah journeys with his people and appears at precisely the moment they think it's time to give up with his presence and the word of God. Jesus gives them some perspective. He says, look at scripture. The people of faith have been through difficult seasons before. Don't give up now. Keep your eyes on the promises of hope. This story normally reminds me of the power we have in communion, in the breaking of bread, in hospitality to the stranger, and in sharing and teaching with the community. But today, it reminds me to trust God. even when I'm not sure where God is. I know that for some of you, digitally attending our church is your normal. 
But for many folks, this has been a shift. And while we are still in the Easter season in which we celebrate the great 50 days of feasting, I know that the shift to online church has created some grief. I would be tone deaf to proclaim a message of hope without recognizing that this is also a season that has been economically, physically, emotionally, and spiritually difficult for people. This is hard. And as we settle into the possibility that we could have as many Sundays ahead of us with this way of doing church as we have Sundays behind us, it might feel harder. It's okay for us to take our time on the long road to Emmaus, to take our time expressing our grief and confusion and anger and dejection, to talk as Cleopas and his partner did with heavy hearts about the crazy times we are in. But we can trust that isn't the end of the story. The difficult season will pass. Together, we can push ourselves a little past this point, a little past our discomfort, a little past our deep grief, and we will come back together to break bread and recall, as the disciples did, all the times during our confusion that our hearts burned in our chest and we too will realize that Jesus has been among us all this time. Thanks be to God. Amen. In response to our sermon, we will hear another offering of music, Blessed Assurance. If you feel compelled at this time to respond to the word of God by giving a financial gift today, please call our office at 304-776-3081, or you can send your uh, gift to our building at 5320 Frontier Drive, Cross Lanes, West Virginia, 25313. Remember, at Cross Lanes United Methodist Church, this offering time is a time of prayer. What does the Lord require of my time, my talent, and my treasure? Now go forth in the name of Christ, who keeps his promises to redeem the faithful. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.